mention for those of you who uh, hear me in passing mention a given book or author or something like that, that on my website, I normally keep a reasonably current syllabus for my course on media. And the last 13 or 14 pages of that consist of an annotated bibliography. So you can go online, it's just tdgordon.net, and you can find the media tab, and then you can open that up, and it may give you information to help you find some summer reading next year or something like that. So help yourself to that if you wish to do so. Last week we were introducing some of the issues associated with what we call media ecology. And uh, the fundamental premise of media ecology is we make tools and tools make us. So there is a reciprocal relationship between humans and their tools. We make tools in order for them to do something we want them to do and then we find that in the process of using them, they shape us. So when I was adding the first room to one of our houses, I've added five rooms over the years to the houses we've lived in. And when I added the first one in Massachusetts, uh, after we f I finished putting the room on, I put a 10 by 14 deck on it. Everybody wants a deck, you know. And uh, as I was laying it out and getting ready to pour the, s the concrete into the sauna tubes for the foundation, um, I did all the measurements, got it where I wanted, and my wife came out there, and I had a shovel, and I was digging down to make the holes to set the, the foundation in it. And she said, what are you making? And I said, calluses, right? <laughs> calluses, right? That's what I'm making. That is to say, in the use of any material thing by a material being, there is a mutual relationship, and that includes our own neurobiology that is shaped by the things that we perceive. So tools do things for us, and tools do things to us. And the goal of media ecology is to understand those things. And so we, we try to understand how the tools that we make turn around reciprocally and shape us also. So we looked at a number of things last week. And uh, today, if you look at your third page, uh, the, the Roman, uh, the, the uh, capital letter D, we want to look this morning at some of the spiritual dimensions of uh, the present moment, the sort of digital smartphone uh, moment. Uh, Gene Twenge, T-W-E-N-G-E, Gene Twenge teaches at South uh, San Diego State University in California, and she released a book last year called iGen, small capital, small I, capital G, iGen in which she used the general social survey to, dis to, uh, to survey young people and, and determine uh, what's happening. And normally when you use the GSS, it takes about 35 to 40 years to get significant differences in attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. She now got a generation difference in the seven years or so between those born before 1988 and those born after 1995. Seven years, and she got a generational difference. And the reason is those born after 1995 had smartphones by the time they were young teenagers. So they're fundamentally different humans. And when I chat with my colleagues in the coffee room and things like this over the last five or six years, one of the things they routinely say is, I'm not sure I'm reaching these people, right? And things that once worked don't work, right? They are very, very different. Now, I try to calm my colleagues down and say they are still the image of God, right? <laughs> right? Once you unpod them and so forth, there is an image of God, right? It's there, and we just have to figure out how to get access to it. Uh, but they are very, very different. So as we introduce the spiritual dimensions, uh, let me, oddly enough, just give you a few lines from uh, Wordsworth's little sonnet. Uh, the world is too much with us. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. This sea that, will be, uh, that her, bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune for this, for everything. We are out of tune. He was observing, of course, a much earlier historical movement when we were becoming urbanized, when Western Europe and the colonies were moving from rural 
reality to urban reality. We just achieved it globally, you know, about two or three years ago. I think 2013, wasn't it? Where over half of the world now lives in a city. So we are now more urban than pre-urban or rural. And uh, Wordsworth observed this. So when he said the world is too much with us, he didn't mean that the natural world was too much with us. The natural world wasn't with us, right? It's the urban world of getting and spending, acquisition, commerce, people bustling and hustling and so forth. That is too much. And now nature, it is, has become foreign to us. And uh, so I, I think he was right. And now what we're dealing with is a further development that may be every bit as consequential as urbanization itself. Uh, several years ago, uh, they released studies to indicate how much time people are on screens today in the United States. By 2008, the figure had hit eight hours a day, and a Ball State uh, re uh, released its report in early 2008 that it had hit eight hours a day. But that was before smartphones and iPads. Now it's 13 and a half hours daily. And if you think that sounds bad, it's worse than it sounds. Because remember, most people sleep roughly eight hours a day, right? My students sleep about 11. There's the part in bed and the part in my classes. So uh, the, I sort of consider myself a public health servant, right? I give them all of this rest and they rejuvenate while they're in my class and they come out all rested. It's wonderful. Um, so if you think about it, we have 16 waking hours in our day. If 13 and a half of those are in front of a screen, we, do, we no longer live in the real world. We literally live in a faux world, right? Because the real world has depth, not merely height and width. It has depth. But the screen world is two-dimensional. It's not three-dimensional, right? In the real world, you can feel moisture in the air some days, especially in western Pennsylvania, right? We should have the legislature change the state flower to mildew since it's always growing <laughs> in our fair commonwealth. Uh, so uh, we, we now live in a world in which we are not very acquainted with the world at all. And Wordsworth was already concerned about that. If he were still around, he'd be very concerned now that we live uh, not in that world. Now, if Rick were here or Nate, because they, they have theological training, you know, they would gently remind us that the, his, the, the theologians have told us historically that God reveals himself in two ways, natural revelation and special revelation. All that he has made, he discloses his power and wisdom and many other traits, and the Holy Scriptures reveal God. Special revelation, linguistic revelation. We are a culture now that is not very much at home with either one of those things. We don't spend much time in the real world. We live by a faux world, a photographed world, a representational world, but not the real world. And image has trumped language since the mid-20th century so that uh, we are less linguistic. When I wrote my little book, Why Johnny Can't Preach, the Media Have Shaped the Messengers, you can see I stole the subtitle from Marshall McLuhan, who said the medium is the message. I, I sort of stole that a little bit from Marshall McLuhan. But the first part I stole from uh, Whimsy and others. Remember in the early 60s, Why Johnny Can't Read appeared. And then in 1992, another author, Why Johnny Can't Write. And so I just did the simple no-brainer calculation. What do preachers do? They read ancient texts and they compose sermons. So if we are a culture where our reading and writing ability is declining, what does that mean for people whose business is reading and writing? And I suggested that preaching was declining because our general cultural sensibilities did not equip us to do the task. And so it was a media ecological argument, and that's what I was doing. So we want to chat a little bit about the spiritual dimensions now, where we find ourselves uh, today. And, uh, and so we find ourselves in what's called a distracted world. Uh, that's the world in which we now live our, uh, our, our lives. Uh, uh, it has been referred to as distracting, alarming, uh, all sorts of different synonyms, but uh, it's a world in which it is not easy to focus on one thing for very long. We are constantly being distracted. 
And uh, I've been troubled for a year by uh, the, the 139th portion of Pascal's Pensee that I've mentioned there for you. Because, you know, he doesn't describe himself. It is not, uh, it is not an expositional work. Pensee are gathered thoughts. In fact, it was posthumously published. You know, he didn't finish it. And we're not sure that in the editions we have whether we have the ordering that he even wanted. There's like two kind of proposals on how the Ponce should be ordered. We're not really sure. So he, ha he drops some of these things, right, like bombs. And, and, and you sort of, you have to savor them like a butterscotch for a while to kind of get a sense of what he's doing. But isn't it interesting that he said all men's miseries, all men's miseries derive from the inability to sit in a quiet chamber alone. Isn't that amazing? Because in the 17th century, they had quiet chambers. Right? This is before the steam engine, before the internal combustion engine, right? Before electricity. But Pascal observed that people didn't want to go there. Isn't that interesting? Even when they were available, people didn't like them. And so the digital world, you see, gives to those kinds of humans exactly what they want. Distraction. Pascal's gener generation would have loved di the digital stuff, you see because they didn't like the quiet chamber, the quiet room alone. Now, he didn't unpack. All I can do is guess from his general orthodoxy why he made the observation and why it's true. I think it's due to this. After the curses of Genesis 3, where all of the noble things that God created us to do are now cursed, right? He said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and now there'll be pain and childbearing, he says, right? He told us to exercise agricultural dominion over the world, and now by the sweat of your brow you will labor, thorns and thistles it will yield, and so forth, right? So we live in a tough, tough environment. And everyone around me is now mortal, and I am too. Everyone around me is sinful, and I am too, right? And so I think what happens in the quiet chamber is undistracted, we are reminded at some level of everything that's wrong with us and everyone else all around us, right? That we would rather busy ourselves with anything other than look at reality. And so uh, I think Pascal was very wise to note that uh, uh, his generation did not like quiet, and ours, if it liked it, would have a hard time finding it, right? It's difficult uh, now to find it. It's one of the reasons I go into the woods once a week. On a good week, I spend one night a week in the forest alone in my hammock under a tarp by a little fire. And uh, I do it because it's real. <laughs> when the students say, why do you go out in the forest alone? I say, well, I go alone because no one with a brain would do it, so I have to go alone. But if you're saying, why do I go there? It's because it's real. Right? It's, it's an, a little bit of reality once a week. Right? There's dirt. Right? And there's a spring coming up out of the ground where I go to get my water. Uh, and there's fire and uh, uh, conifers to get a fire started and deciduous trees to keep it going and so forth and uh, everything you need uh, just to have reality. So I go out there for reality. The students think I'm absolutely nuts, right? When they find out that I do this, they normally raise one of two comments, sometimes both, sometimes one or the other. The first thing they ask is, what about the bears? And I say they'll just have to get used to me. <laughs> the, but then they say, what do you do, right? <laughs> and I say, I sit by a fire, I drink Earl Grey tea, and maybe smoke a cigar, right? And that just unsettles them. The notion that you'd be out there from mid-afternoon all the way until it's time to retire for the evening and not be distracted by anything, that's more frightening to them than the bear, right? <laughs> right? That's just unsettling to them. And so, and so I still do it because I think it's the Pascalian thing to sort of do. So here's what happens that affects us, I think, spiritually. First, the declining literacy that I mentioned from the books, Why Johnny Can't Read and Why Johnny Can't Write, is a big issue for people of the book. Our Muslim friends call us people of the book. That's how they refer to Christians, people of the book, right? And so we have 66 books in the canonical scriptures without a single picture in it. Right? It is a language-based religion. God has disclosed himself in language, and part of his language in there prohibits our making of any religious images. Right? 
completely prohibits our using them all together. And so as we become less and less skilled with language, we become less and less skilled at receiving God's revelation. And we have become less and less skilled uh, at that. So uh, you'll note very th a, a number of things that are happening this way. First of all, contextual interpretation is becoming increasingly rare in the churches. Uh, someone going through Galatians uh, the way Nate is, that is not done in every church anymore, where a serious chunk of that book is read each week, and we give our attention to it, right? You get snippets, right? You get little phrases here and there without a context. And so uh, we get slogans, right? We don't get exposition of passages. Uh, so I, I mentioned uh, Psalm 118, uh, ver uh, verse 24. It's now in 42 hymnals, the musical setting, to Psalm 118, verse 24. And it should not be in any of them, right? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, without a context, what does this mean? It means Sunday, September the 13th, I suppose, or wherever we are. I'm an academic. I'm not real good with these number things, right? But somewhere in mid-September, let's call it that, right? So if you sing it on a Tuesday, it sounds like it's Tuesday, right? Let's, hi, you got to love Tuesday. Let's sing, right? But a demonstrative pronoun, this, may have a noun or pronoun before it. So the previous verse says, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. So what's there before verse 23? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. This is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. It's a reference to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Both he and his apostles always cited it as having exactly that meaning, right? The remarkable real reality that the crucified Christ, the rejected stone, has become the foundation of God's people, right? I don't mind Tuesdays, right? As long as, long as you only get one a week, I, c I can handle Tuesdays. But I live and breathe and hope because of the death and resurrection of Christ. And so we now rejoice in the remarkable paradox that the rejected stone has become the cornerstone. We're not singing about Tuesday, right? We sing about the dying and rising of Christ. But you see, that's what we do with the Bible now. We grab a little snippet here. We grab a little snatch a little chunk here. We got grab a chunk there and so forth. We don't make the effort to see what it actually means in its context, do we? We just grab slogans, right? That's what we get. So, and it's in 42 hymnals. Don't have enough to do with my time. I think I should do something other than research something like that. But I found it in at least 42 hymnals. It shouldn't be in any of them. It doesn't belong. We should stop singing it. <laughs> uh, let's take, take the Bible for what it is. Or then note that your contemporary translations, as I've looked at them, they are not merely contemporary. They're normally childish. They, they, they say they're contemporary, but what they really are doing is they are dumbing the translations down towards a less literate audience, right? The people who do Bible translation have read why Johnny can't read and why Johnny can't write. And they understand that we are less literate than we once were. And so they are giving us basically children's Bibles, but they don't call them children's Bibles because you and I as adults wouldn't be flattered, right? if we knew it was a children's Bible. So just look at the example in Ephesians 1 there that I mentioned. And I have found this all over the place. It's routinely the case. That Paul has a prayer there in Ephesians 1 that uh, runs on uh, uh, from 15 to, to 23. And it's a single sentence in Greek with 19 verbs. So he is capable of managing 18 subordinate verbs to the main verb. And he does it beautifully. It's perfectly elegant in the Greek. And the King James Version was able to translate it in a single elegant English sentence. The RSV also managed to do it in a single sentence. You see some of the others? It took them two sentences or four sentences or five. And then the NIV Reader's Version takes 22 sentences. He only had 19 verbs. Right? <laughs> How did they do that? Right? How did they? And see, they could call that the, the NIV non-reader's version. This is for people who really can't read. Right? They really can't read. And so um, it's okay for children to be children, isn't it? 
uh, grandson Trip just turned two a couple of weeks ago. He's getting very close to saying Papa. He says Pa. <laughs> he points over at me and says Pa. That's close. But one day, you know, not too long from now, he's going to say Papa. And heaven will open, trumpets will be played, and he will get the key to the Mustang GT, right? <laughs> but uh, he, <laughs> right? Uh, now, it's okay for him to be that way. He's just a youngster, right? But remember what Paul said? When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I reasoned as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. And so we ought to be able to employ our language as adults employ it and bring our youngsters on, uh, on board to, to do that with us. But it looks like we're having difficulty doing this uh, now. So uh, part of it is literacy is a real issue for people who know God through a book. And if God revealed himself by FM radio, we would all have FM radios in our house, right? If he revealed himself in smoke signals, I guess we would learn smoke signals, right? But he's revealed himself in language, 66 books of language, right? And to know him requires that we develop some literary sensibility so that we can follow him. Also note that the digital world is the essence of what Ecclesiastes calls vanity. Remember vanity, vanity, all is vanity, said the King James. Now we only use the word vain and vanity, I think, in English to mean self-centeredness or something like that, or caring about our appearances. But that's not what it historically meant in English. A, a, a vain thing was a thing that was, was inconsequential, empty, ephemeral, fading. Uh, and so other translations find other ways of doing it. Uh, emptiness, futility, uselessness, perfectly pointless, all of those are good synonyms for it, and that's the point. But the digital world is exactly that. It's ephemeral, right? It's fading. Nothing that's there lasts very long, and nothing that's there has been around very long. It is essentially a transient reality where everything's fading. The, uh, most of us in our pulpits prefer to take a printed Bible with us in the pulpit, not only because anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Murphy was an optimist, if anything. Um, but the point is, this suggests that this has been around a while, and maybe for a while longer. A screen where its images and things change constantly send the wrong meta message, don't they? Right? Because it makes the eternal word of God look like a fleeting thing. Right? And so even our sensibilities suggest, for instance, that printed Bibles uh, remind us of the permanence of God's truth and revelation. God reveals himself as unchanging. He's not ephemeral. He's not a thing that's constantly changing. And so Henry Light and the well-known Abide With Me, the even hymn, uh, Note, note then that the third or fourth stanza printed there for you on that last page. The page says, uh, change and decay in all around I see, O thou who changest not, abide with me. Right. So change and decay is everywhere. But there is one who was, is, and is to come. Alpha, omega, beginning and end, before all worlds. Right. And so he is fundamentally unchanging, whereas everything else around us is completely unpredictable and changing. So uh, we're trying to shape our sensibilities to appreciate a God like that, and yet our sensibilities are being shaped with little snippets here and there, images coming and going, things moving and things happening and things fading and so forth. Uh, uh, nothing has any real permanence in, uh, in that digital world. And so uh, what happens then is uh, we are having a harder time uh, perceiving religious truth than we once did. We don't spend time in natural revelation, the, the created order, the world, and we aren't very adept at special revelation, right? And so each of them is a little foreign to us and becoming more so all the time uh, because the digital world is essentially a changing world and our faculties aren't what they once were. And so it's, it's just frightening to see uh, the way things change. One of the few benefits, you know, of hitting your sixth decade is some changes that take place culturally you can see in your own lifetime. That's something a 20-year-old can't see because things haven't changed much in 20 years. But when you're a little bit older, you can see it. So, for, for instance, a few years ago, I taught our Bible survey course. Uh, I hadn't taught it for 10 years at the time because they gave me another humanities course to teach. 
And then for one year, they needed me to teach a section of it, so I said, that's fine, I'll do that, and I did. And I thought, well, I'm not going to redo a brand new course for one term, right? I'll just use my old stuff. So I already had lecture outlines, had made them available on the network. I just used my old lectures that I had 10 years before, right? And when I gave the midterm exam, I didn't work up a new exam either. I thought, well, it was good enough last time. And the students, on average, scored 15 points worse than they had 10 years earlier. That's a grade and a half. The, the previous time, using that same, same teacher, same lecture outlines, right? Same course. And the exam was a, an 88 average 10 years earlier and a 73 this time, right? Because they're getting snippets of the Bible in church. They're not getting much Bible, right? And when they do, they're getting biblical texts out of their contacts and so forth. And so in a 10-year period, they dropped 15 points out of, out of a 100-point scale on the same test. Just don't know much about anything that's written. Uh, so uh, it's really, really weird to see because our, our ability to perceive is not growing. It's fading. It's fading. And so I just suggest that fourth point there. This can trouble you for the rest of your life if you want to look for it. But you can actually do sort of a biblical theology of perceptiveness, right? Throughout the Bible, perception, perceiving reality correctly, is always a sign of divine favor and blessing. And imperceptiveness is always perceived as evidence of divine curse, right? And so that's the way it is all the way through. The, the idle polemic especially is that. I just mentioned the one from Psalm 115. You're familiar with that. And it happens several passages in the Old Testament like this, right? talks about the person who makes idols. It says, he fells a tree, and with part of it, he makes a fire and warms himself, right? And with another part, he makes an idol. It has eyes that do not see, ears that do not hear, hands that do not feel, a mouth that does not speak, and those who make them will become like them, right? Imperceptive, blind, deaf, right? So when Isaiah is called to bring judgment upon Israel just before the captivity into Babylon, uh, and he is sent out to bring judgment, God commissions him saying, go and say to this people, you will see and never perceive. You will hear and never understand unless you see with your eyes, hear with your ears, turn in your heart, and I heal you. That's a terrible job, right? It's a tough, tough job. Who wants to be a prophet of judgment? It's no fun. They killed them all, right? Here in western Pennsylvania, we shoot deer, and Israel killed prophets. <laughs> it was open season on the prophets who brought judgment against them. And notice that our Lord referred to Isaiah 6 in answer to his disciples' question. Why are you speaking in parables, they say? Why are you speaking in parables? By the way, that, the question itself is odd, isn't it? We say, well, of course Jesus wore parable, uh, used parables. He, he wore sandals, and he told parables, right? That's just the Jesus we know. <laughs> What kind of a Jesus wouldn't tell parables, we think, right? See, perfectly normal. It did not seem normal to his disciples. They said, why? And it's diete. It's a little stronger in Greek than te. It's diete. It's a fairly strong inter interrogative. Why on earth are you speaking in parables? And you see his answer? He refers to Isaiah 6, right? Because to you it has been given to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. To them it has not been given. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. You will see and never perceive. Hear and never hear, right? Parables are not uh, teacher speech. They are prophet speech. They are judicial speech in the Bible. They are judgment speech. Jesus was a teacher. He was also a prophet. He just said that he's fulfilling Isaiah's ministry. Isaiah was a prophet, right? So when he puts on his prophetic mantle, he brings judgment upon rebellious Israel, the Israel that will put him to death at the hands of the Romans, right? And so he does not tell parables because they make things easy. He tells parables because they make things enigmatic, obscure, difficult, or uncertain. And says that that's why he did it. So by the way, I, I might have just ruined your Sunday. <laughs> just pretend I didn't say that part. But there you have it. And, and notice he says a similar thing towards the conclusion of his earthly ministry in the fourth gospel. For judgment I came into the world, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Right? So he came in to do both. He came to do both. And so it is not a small thing when our eyes do work and when our ears do work, right? When our perceptive faculties work, 
that means through God's grace, common or special, he is causing us to be full, rich humans with perceptive faculties. When we don't perceive, that's another thing altogether. And the digital world teaches us and trains our neurology to make glimpses at things that are moving all the time, right? And so they cultivate our alarming attention, the neurologists call it, at the expense of our executive attention. We become very skilled, very adept at moving from one thing to another quickly, but less adept at focusing on something and concentrating on something. And so we become um, uh, snippet observers uh, rather than uh, other uh, observers, and that's a frightening thing, it seems to me. So here's a few things about attention there. At the bottom, I'll raise a couple questions, and I'll, then I'll botch your questions in a minute here. Uh, that, uh, isn't it interesting that the Shema, right, that's read every week in the synagogues, uh, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, right? Hear Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. But it starts with hear, Shema, hear Israel. He doesn't say, look, but hear, because he makes himself known in the ten words of the covenant that are on the tablets of the covenant, right? And so he calls Israel to give oral attention to his oral uh, revelation to them. Uh, he calls them to, to be attentive. And so if we get better and better at handling image at the expense of handling language, you see, we're not as well adept to give attention as we should. It also, as you know, the, the, the uh, electronic world we mentioned changes forever the relation of the distant and the proximate. Like a seesaw, when one side's up, the other's down. And so what's close, what's proximate, and what's distant, right, are at any given moment in cultural history in a certain state of flux. The electronic world makes distant things close because you can pick up the phone and talk to a person in Dallas, right? Now, why anyone in his right mind would talk to someone in Dallas is beyond me. That's a tougher mystery uh, than I can handle. But you could, right? And you can Skype someone in Korea, right, with the digital materials. But if the distant has become more proximate, the proximate has become more distant. As, as recently as, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, I could actually take a mental stroll in my mind around the neighborhood I grew up in. And I could name every family and how many kids they had and their names. I could do this well up into my mid to late 50s. I don't know the names of people two doors from me in my current neighborhood. Right? All of the attention to things that are distant causes us not to notice the proximate. But isn't that the point of the parable? When it says to love your neighbor and they says, well, you're fine. Who is my neighbor? And what was the answer? The person who's right there, right? right? Some people walked right by and acted like the person wasn't there. And then others walked by and acted like he wasn't there. But he was there, right? And the one who stops and helps him, that's the neighbor, right? So in some sense, God in his kind and wise providence gives us neighbors where we can gently begin the practice of Christian service to show compassion and justice to people who need it, right? And so we should let him dictate that in some sense. Those who are proximate in his providence are our neighbors. And so now the, the, the uh, global village, McLuhan's phrase, has made us aware of all sorts of things about which we can do nothing and has made us unaware of those things about which we could do something. Right? So now we don't know that Widow Jones has come back from a surgery recently and needs someone to make her a casserole because we're worried about tsunamis in the Philippines. Right? But we can't help the Filipinos. We could have helped the Widow Jones. Right? And so now we don't notice what we ought to notice, and we notice what we ought not to notice, and there's no health in us. Something like that, I suppose, is what's happening. I also wonder if the, the constant uh, att attentiveness to things that are changing doesn't breed a certain contempt for things that are old. Moi. <laughs> right? Right? What does the fifth commandment mean now in our generation? Right? When we are a pedocentric culture that measures everything by it being new and recent and hip and with it. Right? It tends to breed a kind of unintended contempt for the wisdom and sometimes the self 
self-control. That's the product of many years of the Holy Spirit answering John Donne's request, batter my heart, three-person God, right? And over the years, he does batter the heart a little bit and make it work a little bit better in his hands. And so, so all of us who have been around any while know that there was a time when we honored those who were older because they were almost always more devout and more wise. Uh, and, and yet, n now we find that the, the seesaw shifting a little bit, right? From our appreciation of the aged to our appreciation of, of the younger. It seems to me that that's going on and so forth. So a couple other things, and I'm going to field a couple questions here. But you'll, every now and then I have people who are, in, are conservative people, and Christians are conservative because we, we worship the God of Abraham, right? So ours is a very old religion. It's about the oldest global religion on the planet. And so we, we are traditionals. traditionalists. We are conservatives. We conserve and preserve memory of the pledges made to Abraham to bless the whole world through one of his descendants, Jesus. And so uh, we, we are that way. Every now and then with such people, they'll say, I think the, the news media are biased in a liberal way. And I say, news itself is liberal. It's the recent, right? It's inherently liberal. Uh, so, of course, the news is liberal. Even conservative news outlets are liberal, right? Because they're giving their attention to what is recent rather than to what is lasting, to what is fading and not what has been around for a long time. And so uh, that's why you don't read yesterday's newspaper, as it were. It's already old news, right? But the good news is also old news, and it's still good news. But it's old news, right? The resurrection is old now, but it's still very, very uh, good news. You can read Dr. Somerville's book to, uh, about that if you're interested in doing so. Um, and so uh, note then that an information generation that has information technologies, I think I've got a dumb phone here. Um, if you put, put that much money into information technologies, you're implying that information is valuable, right? But on the learning scale, according to uh, Dr. Adler, you have uh, information, knowledge, understanding, wisdom, and each builds on the others. The goal, of course, is wisdom, making good choices. But you need to understand how reality works to do that. And it helps to organize things into field that we call knowledge first, right? So you've got inform information is the least consequential thing in the world, all right? The way Neil Postman put it, he says, uh, if, if your children grow up to, to behave shamefully and bring shame to your family, it's not likely to be due to a lack of information. If your marriage ends in divorce, it will not likely be due to a lack of information. If someone you love develops an addiction to some substance, it will not likely be due to a lack of information, right? And he goes on, you know, Postman, and his list just goes and goes and goes and goes. That uh, the consequential stuff is a matter of wisdom and understanding. It's not merely a matter of information. Information by itself, ordinarily, is fairly inconsequential. It's, it's not uh, a terribly important uh, and w wisdom and understanding, on the other hand, take a while, right? That uh, one, one good way to get wisdom is to get uh, wrinkles. <laughs> that's where it comes from, right? That's where, the, that's where you get that. So uh, what kind of attention are we capable of giving is the question we now have. And many of you have read essayist after essayist in the last seven, eight, nine, ten years. Say something like this in a piece that you might read in Atlantic Monthly or The New Yorker or something like that. And they'll say, you know, it used to be on the rainy days when we went to the beach on vacation, those were sometimes my favorite days because I would curl up on a sofa with a good book and a cup of coffee. And now when I find myself on those days, I find that I can't read anymore. I'm distracted. My mind wanders. And I can't focus on the book anymore. And you, you've read those people. You might be those people, right? And what happens in a case like that is your neurology has been reshaped to be very good at flitting from something to another and very bad at focusing on something for a period of time. So when students sometimes say, how will I ever learn uh, uh, to read, let's say, a Tolstoy novel of <laughs> seven or eight, nine hundred pages, and they say, well, don't start with Anna Karenina. Uh, start with novelettes. Get The Old Man in the Sea by Hemingway. What is it, 75 pages? Get something briefer, right? Start there. If you wanted to do 100 push-ups, you wouldn't start with 100. You'd start with 10. And then you get 12, and then you go, right? Keep going. So don't jump right in to a 900-page Russian novel 
Start with something a little briefer. Short stories for people in our day are a good thing to start with because for many people, that's about all they've got. They couldn't do even a novelette, but they could read some nice Chekhov short stories or something else like that, get a nice uh, addition of those. And then when you find that your appetite is good on that, then you can go to The Old Man in the Sea, right? And then you can go on to Joseph Conrad, and eventually you'll graduate from the University of Tolstoy. <laughs> so you'll get there, right, uh, as you move your way along. But you will notice that for many people, we now find that we are incapable of uh, reading or listening or attending to anything carefully. I tell the students the most frequent falsehood told on Facebook, which is saying something, the most frequent falsehood told on Facebook, right, uh, is when people say that the thing that they like to do is listen to music. And I tell my students, no one listens to music, <laughs> right? People hear it all the time. It's in the background at Gap. It's in the background at Sheets. It's in the background everywhere you go, but no one listens to it, right? I hear diesel engines on Broad Street and Grove City when I'm walking down the sidewalk, but I wouldn't put on my Facebook page that I listen to diesel engines. <laughs> so hearing something is not the same as listening to it. Very few people can even listen to the first movement of a symphony, much less all four or five movements. Right? They just can't handle it. Right? It's, it's, it requires too long an attention span, and so uh, people don't really listen to music, they hear it, but they don't really attend to it and listen to it uh, because they don't have the capacity to focus that it requires. By the way, you don't have to be a specialist. It, you can read Copeland's book, What to Listen for in Music. I, I reread it about every six or seven years. Uh, it's still very good, written in the late 30s. Uh, and uh, so he has separate chapters on rhythm, melody, harmony, timbre, and then form. The form is the toughest part. Uh, but he has separate chapters on it, and if you reread it every now and then, you always pick up something you didn't before. But you don't have to do that. The skinny is this. When you listen to a piece of music, listen to every phrase and try to anticipate what will happen next. And be equally delighted if, it's, if you're right or wrong. Right? But to listen is to listen. Right? And to say, I think it would make sense for him to repeat this phrase two or three times before moving on, and then to move in this direction. And then sometimes the composer moves in a different direction than you're expecting, and you go, oh, that was brilliant. I'm glad he did, right? But that kind of listening, real listening, I would submit very, very few people actually do. And so they put it on their Facebook page they do. Isn't there something about that? I'm just be curious. Is it possible that Facebook expresses our aspirations rather than our attainments? Right? I'd like to be the kind of person who could listen to a symphony, right? So maybe if I put it on there long enough, it'll happen. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but uh, it may take us a little bit of work. So, so my thoughts are spirituality itself requires attentiveness. That we, we try to attend to the God who has spoken in creation and spoken in Holy Scripture. And that requires a certain attentiveness. Some of us are old enough, I see there's a few others in here that may be, have just moved beyond 25 or 30, all right? And you remember what we used to call devotional exercises? What did Christians used to call when we spent time in prayer or Bible study? Quiet, Quiet time. Good luck with that, Pascal, <laughs> right? That, uh, that, that's gone the way of all flesh, hasn't it? It would seem anachronistic now, even quaint to refer to our devotional exercises as quiet time. My students would cock their head like a dog on the carpet and go, huh? <laughs> What's, what would that be? What's quiet time, right? And you say, well, well, you carve out a little space where nothing's alarming, right? Nothing's beeping, nothing's tweeting, right? And you focus on something and focus on it uh, for a while. And you learn to savor it and notice what is there uh, rather than jump from one thing uh, to another. So I do think our spirituality will probably taper off if we're incapable of Pascal's quiet chamber. Um, there's a good reason that we don't want to be there, but we still need to be there. Right? We just have to force ourselves through acts of discipline uh, to do that. So uh, those are provisional thoughts. You know, all I was doing these two weeks is sort of introducing uh, some more precise things that others will take us through in the next four weeks. But I thought I would pause today, since I didn't have time to do it last week, to see if you have questions about some things uh, on the outline that were less clear uh, than others. I'll be happy to try to answer them, and if I fail, I'll, I'll get Bill to do it. You can answer them for me. Mahaffey's just great. He can answer anything, right? You could, you could ask Bill right on the spot, what's the square root of 17? And he could probably tell you, right? 
it's more than four or less than five, closer to four, then say, hey, go right on, he'd be great. So if I can't answer your questions, Mahaffey will answer them. Mm -hmm. Just a comment. I started to read Truman's book, uh, Macaw, the Thousand Tales. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, we named a bridge for him, you know, here in Pittsburgh. It, what, what was it before, the 16th Street or 24th Street Bridge that's now the David McCullough Bridge? But, yeah, yeah, we, we, one of our bridges is named for David McCullough. Uh, and his first book, you know, was on the Johnstown Flood. And yeah, he wrote that great book on Trump, Truman. And, uh, and the one on Adams. His one on Adams is just really great. It's really, really good. Uh, and yeah, none of his are brief, are they? Most of his books are pretty lengthy. Yeah. Yeah, I think what happens is you have to know when you want your technology to do something for you and when you want it to do something to you and raise those questions. Because there's serendipitous learning that takes place when you go to the library. Or for us, when we were children, the uh, World Book Encyclopedia. You'd be looking up one thing, right? I think I remember once looking up something about Prime Minister Churchill and was very surprised to find that he was from a long line of descendants who had served in places of leadership in Great Britain and so forth. I hadn't known that before. I wasn't looking for that, but I found it. And so what happens uh, when you're going to a library shelf to get a book, you notice often three or four others nearby that are even closer to what you were looking for. I didn't know it, right? And so uh, I, I think what you have to do is say, if it's merely the, the simplest form of information, so down here on the information end of information, knowledge, understanding, wisdom, uh, we probably say that's where they help us the most. But if we start moving up through knowledge towards understanding and wisdom, we may find that for those kinds of things, there's another way of going about it that would serve us better. I mean, frankly, I think that you can pull up Psalm 118, 24 on a verse of the day thing somewhere, and that's probably what happened. But you could also read it in its context and say, what does the demonstrative pronoun this refer to? And then you wouldn't have to be Shakespeare to figure it out. It, it, it's just there right, if you want to do it. So that, that's what I try to I try to limit the amount of attention I give to digital things if there's other ways of doing it. And I try to set aside time to immerse myself in other forms of learning. So I listened to Brahms number four last week um, and was doing a lot of Schumann earlier in the summer. Um, and so every now and then I'll set aside an evening where I want to make sure there's nothing digital anywhere nearby, and I just want to listen to music or read something uh, without being disturbed. Because the problem with the digital world is that it does tend to draw you in. Think of how often you say, well, I'm just going to log on real quickly to check for X. You think it'll be five minutes, and 35 minutes later, you're still there. Uh, so you're, you're, I think you almost have to change by putting on the new man and not just put off the old man, as it were. Paul does both, you see. So you have to replace one habit or, or behavior with another. And so I just think planning to make sure you, you give yourself some quality attention time from time to time is probably the best thing to do. Just do something positive. And you find that would work. Yeah, because those are helicopter parents, too. So, yeah, yeah. I think you're right in the sense that like, younger, younger kids are more deeply enmeshed in technology, but also more questioning. In a lot of ways. Yeah, I think that you're right. What, what we're seeing now, just in the last three or four years, I've been seeing that they are so aware that people are trying to get their attention. We call it an attention economy now. 
And they're aware of that, right? So they've kind of become early cynics. At an early age, they realize everybody wants their attention. So I think they are a little bit more aware than would have been the case 10 years ago, that people are trying to get their attention. And so uh, I think many of them now are aware of this. I think they get there by different avenues, I suspect. Some of them will read a story on Google selling their information, and that bugs them, right? And so there's a variety of different things that are making them uh, become savvy users of these realities. Uh, I think you'd probably see mixed evidence. Uh, commercial forces teach us that all change is progressive and positive. It's a line extending infinitely. Uh, my opinion is that it's an arc, that ordinarily when smart humans work on something for a while, at a certain point that it sort of tops out. They've probably done about all that can be done, and any change after that is probably retro. So you, you can f see this in lots of different areas where that's the case. So I think what happens is the, the commercial forces in the culture are, are trying to encourage uncritical acceptance of all new things. And yet the image of God in humans says you can feel, fool some of the people some of the time, right? So I do think the image of God seeks equilibrium. I think, it, it, I think when it finds itself being intuitively aware that it's out of balance, it starts to adjust. So I don't think that the matter is determinist. I do think you know, smart people realize this and make their adjustments. Um, but you have to be willing at some point to see how um, the commercial complex of forces wants to jerk you around. And it wants you to be attentive to things that probably we needn't give our attention to. And it also is perfectly content for us to have abbreviated attention span, right? So it also wants to sell us on the idea that uh, jumping from one thing to another is sort of normal. Uh, and so, yeah, now some people, I think, are responding. What, what I'm glad we didn't have, we didn't have boys, we had girls, right? Um, but I would have been a very unpopular father if I'd have had teenage sons and said, I don't want you spending hours a day on video games. Because there, there's a dreadful for your attention span. Just dreadful for your attention span. And, and I would probably have to say, by the way, some of the prettiest co-eds at Grove City College say, it's a turnoff, right? So you, you want to know that's what the females think about it, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. So that's the one that, that worries, uh, uh, I think, a lot of parents is how do they modulate this incessant desire to play those things uh, frequently. Uh, let me just give you one observation about the college that may pertain to this, may not, but it's just kind of interesting. I asked Dr. Uh, DeStacy several years ago if they had uh, uh, diagnostics running throughout the day on our network on campus. And he said, sure, of course, you know, Smiley runs that stuff and we have to run that stuff. And so I said, uh, what's your period of peak use? And he says, well, we run, we run at about 98% of peak from 6.30 a.m. until 3.30 a.m. And only between 3.30 a.m. and 6.30 for three hours are we more than a little bit off of 98%. So somebody is up on the internet until 3.30 in the morning. A lot of somebodies, right, who can't get off. Yeah, if it's running 21 hours a day at peak, there's only three hours a day that it isn't. And maybe that's why they sleep through classes, right? That could be the other reason, right? So, well, thanks for your attention to me, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy and benefit from the next four weeks also. I think you've got good people lined up, so enjoy those, and God bless you all. <laughs>